Everybody from the biggest entrepreneurs and CEOs to the world leaders are talking about how this is going to be India's decade. I predict that the 21st century is going to be the Indian century. That India is in a position to be one of the greatest global economies. I think there's no question that this is going to be India's decade and maybe India's manifold decade. And even all the data, such as our population peaking, Apple moving its manufacturing to India, Tesla entering India seems to be pointing in that direction. But on the other hand, we see our GDP growth slowing down, inflation rising, consumption going down, and the cost of living is just skyrocketing. So what's really happening in the country? The problem is no one is talking about the current state or facts about how India is really progressing in today's world. What about the country's present and the future? So today, I have with me a report that tells us everything about how India is performing today compared to other countries globally. We can also understand through data what we need to focus on to become the best India possible. This is a very interesting report released by Bloom Ventures, where they conduct research and gather insights about the evolving India, putting it all together in what they call the Indus Valley Report. Just like Silicon Valley in the US, the term Indus Valley is a reference to the entire Indian startup ecosystem spread throughout the country. The Indus Valley report is published every year by Bloom Ventures. Look back and take stock of its evolution and look ahead of what is coming. And we love breaking it down every year. Welcome to the fourth edition of the Indus Valley Annual Report. This is Varun Kuntur and you're watching Breakdown by TBH, a series where we break down some of the most interesting data and reports just like these. Let's get started. This report is broken down into two sections. Section one is about India. Like I said before, India is a land of contradiction and this tweet clearly describes that. The associations in this tweet expose a clear bias. Many of these would be considered inappropriate. Yet, ChatGPT offers us a glimpse at how India's deeply rooted social structures continue to shape perspectives, even when filtered through modern technologies and global pop culture touch points. But where does India stand today? India is still the fastest growing GDP in the world with a growth rate of 6.5% in 2024, while the US and China's GDP seem to be slowing down and expected to shrink further in 2025. In terms of market cap, India currently ranks number four with 4.5 trillion dollars just behind China. But when it comes to the per capita income, India seems to be at the 149th position with just $2,900, which shows that an average Indian makes just about 20,000 rupees a month. Coming to the inflation numbers, India ranks fourth worldwide with a 4.4% inflation every year just behind Mexico. It seems like the rising prices aren't going to stop anytime soon. But how did we get here? If you take a closer look at the last five years and compare India's economy before and after the 2020 pandemic, we can clearly clearly see that the COVID-19 pandemic dealt India a severe economic shock. India's GDP growth during the pandemic went to minus 5.8%. Even when compared to other countries, the Indian GDP growth rate went to a low of minus 7.3%, while the rest of the world just saw a 3.3% slowdown in the GDP growth rate. To combat this economic decline, aggressive government spending was coupled with historical low repo rates from RBI to push the economy forward. The government capital expenditure spends went from 3.4 trillion rupees to 5.9 trillion rupees, massive 76.5% increase from 2020 to 2022. At the same time, the RBI also declined the repo rate from 6.25% to 4%. Repo rate is basically the interest rate at which the banks borrow from RBI at. When the RBI reduced the interest rates, there was a sudden surge in personal borrowing that nobody had anticipated. 34% of all borrowings were just personal loans in 2023. A big increase over the years from just 26% of borrowings were personal loans back in 2018. These personal loan borrowings led to a consumption boom, sparking a V-shaped recovery. With our GDP growth growing from minus 5.8% in 2021 to 9.7% in 2022, a massive 15% growth in just one year. But such a recovery came with its own cost, a rising inflation and a soaring fiscal deficit. You see, the revival of the Indian economy was achieved through aggressive government spending. 
which doubled the fiscal deficit between 20 and 21, eventually resulting in a rise in money supply. The combination of the increased money supply along with the surging personal credit and resurgent consumption pushed the inflation upwards. The inflation in the country went from a standard 4 to 4.8% to 6.6% and has stayed at about 6% for the last two years. Seeing the inflation rise, the RBI began monetary tightening, steadily brought back the repo rate from 4% to 6.5%. Meanwhile, the Indian consumer got worried because of slow wage growth and continued inflation numbers. While the average CPI inflation was at 5.7%, wages only grew by a mere 2.8% in BFSI, 3.7% in retail, 4% in IT, 4.2% in logistics, and 5.4% in the FMCG sector. But the GDP growth is sustained by the heavy government capex spending in the election year 2024. For the first time, the GDP wasn't driven by private consumption as it went down to 4%, while the GDP went up to 8.2%. But immediately after the election, the government stopped spending, which led to the GDP growth tapering down to 8% in the last quarter. The Indian economy is shaped by the interaction between several long-term structural forces and trends. Let's take a look at these trends one by one. Consumption and services drive the Indian economy unlike in China where investments and manufacturing play a key role in driving their economy. There are two ways to understand the Indian GDP. One way is we can divide the GDP by expenditure components. Private consumption takes about 56% of the GDP, investments take 33%, government spending takes up about 9% and exports and imports take up just 2%. The other way is to divide the GDP into sectoral splits. Then we can see that services make up 54% of the GDP, industry or manufacturing makes up 31% of the GDP, and agriculture makes up the remaining 15% of the GDP. From both of these, we can see that private consumption and the services sector are the main driving forces of the Indian economy. When we compare India's service exports to the global service exports, India stands third, just behind Singapore and Ireland, contributing to 10.9% of all global service exports. In the service export, IT services exports make up 46.6%, but professional consulting has been steadily increasing to 18.3% from just 7% in 2005. Second trend, we are seeing a steady but firm shift to an organized, branded, formal market from what was an unorganized, unbranded, and an informal market. The number of GST taxpayers has gone up significantly significantly to 14.9 million taxpayers in 2024 compared to the 6.8 million taxpayers in 2017. This formalization is also visible in the consumer economy. Indian jewelry market is currently 40% organized and 60% unorganized. Similarly, the real estate market is also seeing an increased market share of listed and unlisted developers making up 33% and local contractors making up about 67%. We are also seeing a rise in branded products. The fans market is currently 90% branded and only 10% unbranded. The wedding market also saw the branded players taking up 30% of the market compared to just 10% in 2015. Third trend, India doesn't save enough. Although India's overall savings rate looks okay, it is not. India has a much lower savings rate than its Asian peers especially China. Only 30% of India's GDP came from savings. And of this 30%, only 18.4% came from household savings. And of this 18.4%, only 5.1% was from financial savings, as the rest of it was from physical savings. And this is a big reason to worry for Indians. This shows that most Indians clearly aren't able to save any money because of the rising debts. The household debt to GDP has reached an all-time high of 42.9% in quarter one of 2024. And three of this is not debt taken as housing loan. Most of this is loans taken as small ticket personal loans. Over 121.9 million people are taking more small size loans averaging at 65,000 rupees. Fourth trend, why land issues mean India holds up on gold. Indians have a special relationship with gold. India is the second largest consumer of gold globally and as Indians preferred savings instruments, gold's impact is seen across our economy. India is the second largest consumer of gold in the world, right after China. After property, gold accounts for the largest share in household assets, with equities only making up 5%. We import so much gold that it has a significant impact on our current account deficit. About 10% of all imports in India is just gold. But what really makes gold even more attractive in India is that land in India is not a good source of collateral. India has one of the smallest housing loan market in the world, and the average time to enforce a contract in India is 1,445 days, compared to the global average of 358 days. 
The fifth trend, India under invests in its human capital. Of the 1400 million population, only 961 million are in the working age. Of this, only 578 million people are active in the workforce. In this, 3.2% are unemployed, 58% are self-employed, and majority of this includes unpaid helpers in a household. 20% are casual workers, 13% are salaried employees without a job contract, and 9% are salaried employees with a contract. India has a disguised unemployment problem and a jobless growth problem. But what's more worrying is, higher the education level, higher the unemployment rate. Over 28.7% of unemployed youth are graduates and above. 11.5% are secondary or higher secondary. Only 3.2% are below primary. Well, this is primarily because India's youth want AC jobs or government jobs. We have fewer government jobs than our peers, but these are highly paid relative to the private sector. Government school teachers are paid 5 to 10 times more than the private school teachers. The high pay and job security is a key reason for the high demand for government jobs and the many years invested in writing exams to break into these jobs. The main issue? India under invests in its human capital. India only invests 2.7% of GDP on education spending when compared to 4.1% in China and 5% in the US. India's demographic dividend is here. To take advantage of it, we have to focus on upskilling our workforce and AI proofing them. Demographic dividend is the phase in which the proportion of the working age population, typically ages 15 to 64, increases rapidly compared to the number of dependents that are children and elderly. Sixth trend, India has struggled to grow its manufacturing sector historically, though it is making a spirited attempt now using imported bans, tariffs and production linked incentives. India has historically underperformed on the manufacturing front and Indian manufacturing's share of GDP is at its lowest ever, at just 12.9% of GDP coming from manufacturing. But why? Well, it's primarily because of land, labor and capital. Low skill levels in the Indian labor force mean that despite lower wages, the net impact is neutral as a lower skilled workforce is less productive. Industrial land is expensive in India when compared to other similar economies. In fact, land costs are 25% higher in India when compared to Thailand. Even lending rates are much higher in India versus other countries. Import bans and increased tariffs have significantly reduced imports in sectors like air conditioners and toys with toy tariffs raised from 20% to 70% making India a net exporter. Seventh trend. India wants surplus savings are finding their way into equity market creating the fourth largest equity market and the biggest equity derivatives market. Domestic capital is increasingly driving the Indian stock market with domestic investor ownership of Indian stocks catching up steadily to foreign investors investor ownership. It seems like domestic institutional investor flows into Indian stock market are at a record levels, with around half of those inflows coming from mutual fund SIPs contributing to 2.68 trillion rupees. India's retail participation in f and trades is the highest in the world, but more than 90% of participants lose money. This brings us to the last part of section 1, India's consumption. India's consumption numbers look good on an overall basis, but not on a per capita basis. Consumption seems to be the dominant driver of India's GDP with 60.3% from private consumption and 30.8% coming from government consumption. Now, if you look at India's retail consumption, this is what it looks like. Online is just 7% while offline still takes up 93%. 7% is branded market and 63% unbranded. Lastly, only 29% is discretionary spending while the remaining 71% is non-discretionary spending. Relative to large economies, India's consumption growth is amongst the highest. In fact, India's consumption growth outpaced major global economies in 2023. But when we look at it on a per capita basis, it doesn't look as impressive. Credit card penetration is just at 3%. Mutual fund penetration at just 21%. Only 162 wheelers for every 1000 people. Only 8% air conditioner penetration. An average of about $46 on FMCG spends per person and only 1.9 pairs of footwears sold per person. Not just that, even the cement, electricity, hotel rooms and travel consumption is very low in India compared to other economies. But why does India consume so little? Why are penetration rates so low across so many categories? The answer likely lies in the nature of the consumer economy structure or the Indian consumer stack as Bloom calls it. India is divided into three consumer classes. India 1, India 2, 
and India 3. India 1 constitutes about 10% of the population but accounts for two-thirds of discretionary spending. This is what most of the Indian startups like Cred, Zeroda, Mama Earth and Netflix target. India 2 represents 23% of the population contributing only one-third of discretionary spending and is characterized by heavy consumers but reluctant players. OTT or media, gaming, edtech and lending are relevant markets for them. Then there's India 3 who are non-monetizable. They primarily use apps like WhatsApp, YouTube, which are free. Some apps are used across different Indias, like WhatsApp, YouTube, Flipkart. A good way to understand the above is that all apps in India 3 can be used by India 2 and India 1. Similarly, India 2 apps can be used by India 1. The reverse isn't true. India 1 apps are not used by India 2 or India 3. However, the consumer economy is deepening rather than widening. With a rise in premium and executive segment products, while low-end sales are staying the same. Domestic air passenger traffic has not grown much after FY21-22, COVID slowdown. Similarly, two-wheeler sales volumes have remained muted following 21-22 COVID slowdown. Even food ordering MAUs haven't grown. But on the other hand, premium and executive segment motorcycles between 2019 to 2023 have increased. High-end and ultra-luxury housing has doubled in the last five years. Although the passenger car market has remained stagnant, but the premium car segment has increased massively. The gap between tax filers and taxpayers is only widening, with only 2% of Indians paying taxes compared to 10% in China and 43% in the US. India's wealth growth rates rank fifth globally, with the top 10% increasingly capturing a larger share of national income. India 1's high share of consumption is shaping up the Indian consumer market in very distinct ways. India 1 is helping spark a fast-growing equity market, as well as the rise of the experience economy, a key aspect of which is travel and the creation of homegrown, premium or luxury brands in several categories, and increasingly how our cities are evolving. It seems like India 1 is a high-income country within a country. And India 1 will be an advanced economy well before India overall becomes a developed country. India 1 in population size would be the 10th most populous country. Basis per capita income, India 1 would be the 63rd in the world above Russia and China and way ahead of India, ranked 140th. That brings us to the end of section 1 of the report. The section 2. Indus Valley is all about the Indian startups and the changing market with massive adoption of AI. The second part of this video will be out in two to three days. Subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss out on it. And if you like this video, then don't forget to smash that like button before leaving. That's it for me. Bye bye. Chu open idol. Ah, chur mele. Ah, bye, wait. Bye bye.